we're all set to go. Awesome. Yeah, so hello, welcome back to another Iowa Learning Farms webinar. Uh, my name is Mitch Harding. I am a water outreach specialist with uh, Iowa Learning Farms. And today we're gonna learn a little bit from Dr. Bill Johnson about um, how cover crops impact residual herbicides in corn and soybeans. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna send it over to Dr. Johnson. Okay, um, Mitch, are you ready for me to start? Yep. Okay, all right. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to have this discussion with you regarding some of the work that we've done with um, cover crops and, and residual herbicides. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, there's kind of three main topics that I'm going to uh, discuss in this presentation. And won't spend a whole lot of time on the on the first one, but just kind of establish and you know in, in everybody's mind why why we're doing this, why are we using cover crops for weed control, and then as a weed scientist and, and someone with some experience in, in environmental fate research, I'm obviously very interested in what happens to the herbicide um, after it's sprayed, and so. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of places where it's uh, it's claimed that there's a lot more microbial activity in the soil uh, where we grow cover crops. And since most of our uh, herbicide groups are broken down by soil uh, microbes, does this enhanced microbial activity result in less persistence of, of herbicides in the soil environment? So we initiated some research to uh, to address that topic, and I'll present some of that here. And then we'll also talk about the impact of, of the residue in in the in in, in its in the herbicide's ability to to reach its intended target, which you know would either be the weed or the or the soil. So let's go ahead uh, to the next slide then. So again, the first thing I want to do is kind of establish you know why we're using cover crops for weed control. And this graphic and the next one uh, show the um, the documentation of, of herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, on this particular slide here, we're looking at uh, glyphosate resistant weeds. And essentially what you see here is from about 1995 to present, we have anywhere from about one to five new weeds each year that are documented to be resistant to glyphosate or to Roundup. And so um, as, as most of you know, in our corn and soybean production systems in, in the Midwest, glyphosate is easily the, the most widely used herbicide. And so as we develop more glyphosate resistant weeds and we have increased areas that are infested, you know, obviously we, we need more tools for, for controlling weeds. So if we can go on to the next slide. So one of the, the, the first things we do when, it, when we start to develop a herbicide resistant weed and we have a very effective herbicide is we add another herbicide to it. And in the case of glyphosate, we, re, we relied very heavily on what we call these group 14 herbicides. Group 14 herbicides would be things like Cobra, Reflex, um, Authority, Valor, Sharpen, and things like that. And what you can see is, you know, really since about 2005 to 2010, we've had a very rapid increase in the number of weeds that are resistant to these group 14 herbicides as well. So you can go down the list of every herbicide family um, that gets added to the tank with uh, glyphosate um, eventually, we're going to develop weeds that are resistant to both herbicides. And again, we, it just emphasizes the importance of bringing additional tools uh, back onto the acre in, in terms of being able to manage our weed populations. So let's go on to the next slide. So the solution in, in days gone by used to be um, industry would spit out another herbicide for us uh, to utilize. Um, but this graphic here shows you uh, the introduction dates of various herbicide groups. And, and what, what you should see from this graphic here is starting about 1945 when 2,4-D was, was introduced to about 1980, um, we had a pretty steady increase in the number of, of new um, sites of action that were introduced into our, our herbicide arsenal. But really since about 1980, we've only had one new site of action uh, this made it onto the marketplace and these group 28 herbicides as of right now aren't being used on a very widespread basis they're kind of limited in the in in their utility in corn and soybean systems so 
we're, we're relying on fairly old technology with regard to herbicides uh, in terms of, of how we're um, how we're managing weeds. So this has brought back this this um, emphasis on things like harvest weed seed control, um, hand weeding, and things like cover crop and in in uh, in crop tillage as well as tools that we need to, to maintain our high crop yields. So let's go on to the next slide. So now we'll kind of just start our, our a more targeted discussion about cover crops. So one of the things that you'll get most weed scientists to agree on is the fact that in order to get weed suppression from a cover crop, we need biomass. And um, if, you, if you look in the scientific literature, what most of this, the experiments out of the middle part of the country would tell you is you need a minimum of 2,500 to 3,000 pounds per acre, which is the same as kilograms per hectare of, of biomass to start getting some, some reliable weed suppression it tends to peak at about 8,000 pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare. And so somewhere in that 3,000 to 8,000 pound range is kind of the sweet spot in terms of being able to utilize cover crops as a weed control tool. So this is a graphic here. I had one of my uh, former graduate students put together from uh, six site years of experiments that, that that particular student has done to basically show you what that relationship looks like. So again, very variable weed control when our cover crop biomass is, is below 3,000 kilograms per hectare and it becomes much more consistent as we increase that biomass, but it does create some other challenges. Those, those, those high levels of biomass do create some other challenges with regards to, uh, to getting herbicides to the target and sometimes with, with regard to crop competition. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so one of the, I think one of the, the really neat success stories about cover crops is the ability of cereal rye to suppress a weed called mare's tail or horseweed. We're, we're talking about the same weed there. And so this is arguably um, the, the most reliable um, weed control situation with, with a cover crop is being able to use a fall planted cereal rye cover crop to suppress a weed like mare's tail. So here's just a picture here that shows one of our experiments from a few years ago. And if we go on to the next slide, um, you can see that, you know, what we end up with is, is, is uh, even when we do have mare's tail that, uh, that emerge in a cereal rye cover crop, they're much smaller. And so they're gonna be much easier to control with, um, um, with our herbicides during our burn down applications in the spring. So a, a three inch tall mare's tail is much easier to control than an eight or nine inch tall mare's tail. So again, that, that's, a, that's an example there of a very um, reliable interaction that we see with, with cover crops and weed suppression. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of, of additional weed species. So if we could go on to the next slide here, I'll share some data um, that we've generated with water hemp. So, um, as, as most of you know, water hemp is kind of the, the bane of Midwest uh, soybean production. Um, it's easily our most problematic broadleaf weed and has been for a number of years. And um, it's, you know, the reason it's so problematic is it, it's developed resistance to just about everything we've tried to spray on it. So we had an experiment here where we, um, we looked at uh, three different cover crop treatments. We had cereal rye, we had a mixture of cereal rye and crimson clover, and then we had a situation with no cover crops. And then we evaluated three different uh, herbicide strategies, uh, glyphosate alone or Roundup alone, uh, Roundup plus 2,4-D, that would be the glyphosate plus auxin, and then Roundup 2,4-D and the appropriate uh, residual herbicide for, for the weed spectrum at that particular site. So we evaluated then those three herbicide programs with three different cover crop treatments and three different termination timings. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of a lot of information there. All right, so I'm gonna, there's a lot of information on this graphic, but I'm gonna simplify it for you. So this is water hemp biomass and this would be kind of a mid-season measurement. And basically what this graphic tells you is that when you terminate really early, you have a lot more water hemp biomass in the summertime. When you terminate at planting or two weeks after planting, these systems are much more effective. And again, that kind of makes sense. Water hemp emerges 
kind of late in the spring, and so you want that cover crop out there as long as possible. You want your herbicides applied as late as possible as well. Um, what this graphic also tells you is that uh, having cereal rye or a mixture of cereal rye and, and crimson clover um, tended to give you better suppression of water hemp than applying that herbicide to bare ground. So again, that's a, that's a success story with water hemp uh, but the key there, again, is to delay that termination as long as, as long as you can. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now, with regard to annual grass control, and this would be primarily things like giant foxtail, um, fall panicum, um, and, and some of those types of weeds, some of the, the annual grasses that are fairly common across the Midwest. Uh, we had some experiments in corn where we looked at... Um, uh, a, a, a fallow situation or a cereal rye cover crop, we would terminate the cereal rye at planting. And, uh, and what we found is that um, obviously the, we, we got some annual grass suppression in both cases. Um, but what we see here is that when we apply uh, glyphosate with a residual herbicide combined with a cover crop, and we take a look at these blue bars over here on the right hand side, the best overall treatment then is when we put on um, glyphosate with a residual herbicide in the cereal rye cover crop. So again, in terms of a, of a success story, we've got mare's tail. Cereal rye works very well on mare's tail. We saw good water hemp suppression um, with, with a cereal rye based cover crop and we're seeing some, some good annual grass suppression as well. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, Giant ragweed is a little bit of a different story. So again, what we've what we've learned over the years with, um, with with cover crops and weed suppression is the small seeded stuff that tends to germinate near the soil surface and that germinates somewhat early in the spring. We have reasonably good success with that. Some of the larger seeded broadleaf weeds, where the seed contains more um, energy products to help that weed seed push through a lot of biomass, we tend to be a little bit less successful with cover crops. And giant ragweed for us would certainly fit into this category. So again, a little bit different result here. Um, we, we are getting some, some decent uh, suppression of biomass. Um, you know, when, when we combine a, a residual herbicide with it, but in terms of, uh, of density, we don't really see uh, much of a re reduction in density. So again, um, we, we don't see a, a negative impact of having the cover crop out, out there. We're just not seeing as much of a positive impact um, with having the cover crop out there, okay? All right, let's go on to the next slide. All right, now, so, that, so we kind of established what we know about, about weed control. Um, and, and I've got a bunch, a bunch of more um, data that I could show you on other weed uh, species as well, but I kind of wanted to focus on some of the, some of the major ones and kind of explain the, the, the general overall picture. So now what I want to do is dive a little bit more into the details and talk about um, residual herbicides and then herbicide degradation in the, in the soil profile. So really the question we're trying to answer is do the claims of increased soil biology soil micro, um, act, microbiological activity, does that result in more rapid degradation of residual herbicides, which would shorten um, the amount of residual control that we get with our residual herbicides? So let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so we had an experiment that we uh, did at two locations, and these locations are about 100 miles apart. They're in the northwest quadrant of Indiana. Um, the site that's furthest north is a sandy loam soil, a little bit lower in organic matter than our site in, in really in more west central Indiana. So we had very similar, or we had the exact same treatments, excuse me, at both sites. We varied the residual herbicide rate just a bit. We put a little bit less on the lighter soil as the label would dictate. And then we uh, collected a lot of information out, out of these particular plots. So we'll go over some of that information that was collected. So let's go on to the next slide here. Okay, so this is the activity of, of beta-glucosidase. Beta-glucosidase 
is an enzyme in the soil that, um, that degrades organic matter. So this is a very common measurement of soil microbiological activity. And so um, what you see here is the, is the microbial activity at various times during the growing season for the uh, 2020 growing season, the 2021 growing season, and the 2022. So these, were, these are long-term plots. So we establish plots in the same location every year. We're in a corn soybean rotation. So in 2020, we were corn. 2021, we were soybean. 2022, we were back to corn. And here, now in 2023, we're back to soybean. So what you see here is the beta glucosidase activity at these various uh, sample points. And if we go on to the next slide, I'll kind of uh, boil this down into a little bit more concise dis uh, discussion. So at the site with higher organic matter, at our TPAC site, we really didn't see a lot of differences. Overall, we saw higher microbial activity, but we didn't see a lot of differences between plots that have cover crops and plots that did not have cover crops. At the site with lower organic matter, um, during the first year, 2020, about 50% of the sample timings, we saw higher microbial activity in plots where we had uh, cover crops. In 2021 and 2022, um, we were more, more likely to find that cover crop plots had higher microbial activity at all sample timings. So again, it took, took a year or so to kind of get us into that higher uh, microbial activity. So that's, again, that's beta glucosidase and that's a very common one that's, that's uh, measured in the soil. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So dehydrogenase is, a, is an enzyme in the soil that's known to degrade atrazine. So this was the other one that we measured as well. So again, we're showing data here from, from three different years, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And you'll notice that, that those um, lines tend to lay on top of each other. And if we go on to the next slide here, I've got more of a summary. So very similar to what we saw with the beta glucosidase, um, we did not see a difference at the, uh, at the site with higher organic matter, but at the site with lower organic matter, we saw enhanced dehydrogenase, about 50% of the sample timings during the first year and 100% of the sample timings in the second and, and third year of the trial. Okay, so let's go on to the, the next slide. Um, in terms of the atrazine concentration that, that hits the soil, um, you know, as you might expect, wherever you have something covering the ground, we tended to have uh, lower rates of atrazine that hit the soil. But the interesting thing is that we, we got some precipitation events between time zero and 10 days after, uh, after the treatments were applied. And what we found out is these uh, soil concentrations tended to equilibrate and be about the same by the time we got the 10 days after treatment. So a little bit lower at time zero with the, uh, the cereal rye and the crimson clover uh, cover crop treatments. Um, but again, things started to equilibrate by the time we got to about 10 days. And that's again, because we had some rainfall events. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, that didn't come through very well. So that, that indicates that there is about a 41% uh, reduction between the, um, between the fallow and, and the cover crop treatments. For some reason that came through some complicated symbol in the email. So anyway, sorry about that. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so um, I'm not gonna read this to you here, but, but basically I'm, I'm just restating what I, what I told you earlier. Um, we had a, it, it took, at both sites, it took about a year to get this microbial activity enhanced, or not really enhanced, but um, consistently higher at, at all the sample timings. We didn't see that the first year. That was more likely to occur in years two and years three. Um, and again, you're more likely to have higher organic matter, or excuse me, higher microbial activity where you have higher organic matter, which um, that, that's just common sense if you, if you think about soil biology in general. Um, we evaluated both atrazine and uh, in Callisto. Callisto is, is mesotrione. And, uh, you know, we found that the cereal rye biomass um, decreased the amount that initially hits the soil, about 40% or so. But again, once you get to about 10 days or so, as long as you have some, uh, 
precipitation events, we were able to get those concentrations to equilibrate by, by 10 to 14 days after, after the termination. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, um, what about, so here's another set of exper experiments I wanna talk about. We evaluated the influence of, of termination strategies on weed suppression and residual herbicide availability. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. So here we had a situation where we looked at roller crimped cereal rye and standing cereal rye. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And uh, here's what our uh, sulfentrazone, uh, this would be the same thing as, as authority, what our sulfentrazone concentrations in the soil looked like in this particular experiment. So the blue line there would be the, the no cover crop treatment. So you can see we're getting about 700 parts per billion at time zero. Um, the standing and the fallow, or excuse me, the standing cereal rye and the roller crimp cereal rye were less. And, and as you might uh, guess, the, uh, the, the roller crimp cereal rye forms a really nice blanket on the soil. And, uh, and that really um, it intercepts a lot of the, the herbicide residue at time zero. Um, but again, you get out to about 14 to 28 days after applications and those concentrations uh, tend, to, uh, tend to equilibrate just a bit. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, we also, um, we, we used a premix of solventrazone and chloranselam called first rate. We also uh, measured the chloranselam uh, residues as well. And kind of the same thing, you know, the cover crop prevents some of it from getting to the soil surface, but as long as you had precipitation events, um, you were able to get those concentrations to equilibrate by about 14 days after treatment. All right, let's go to the next slide. So again, that basically um, just restates what I indicated on those previous two uh, data slides. Um, I do think, you know, again, it's, it's very important to have these residual herbicides, uh, particularly against things like water hemp, you know, that produces a lot of seed. And so, you know, so, so far we, we haven't really found any negative impacts of using residual herbicides with cover crops, even where we have high levels of, of biomass. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, um, this is kind of an interesting project, and this is kind of the, the last project that I'll talk about here. Uh, what about simulated rainfall? And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, how much simulated rainfall does it take to wash a, a, a cover crop off of cereal rye residue? So let's go on to the next slide. So uh, we set up an experiment at our main location. Our, our main plots were uh, the amount of rainfall, so we either had no rainfall, a half inch of rainfall or an inch of rainfall. And then the cover crops were in one of uh, two different orientations. We either left it standing or we roller crimped it. And then we also had a, a fallow or a no cover crop uh, treatment as well. Um, the rainfall, we set up rainfall simulators. They started at 30 minutes after the atrazine was applied and continued for 20 minutes. And then we collected plant samples and soil samples and, uh, and extract the residues off of those media. So let's go on to the next slide. Here's a setup of what this looked like. Uh, so this was actually a simulator that we built and the, uh, you can see the nozzles there um, on the top of the, the simulator. And basically these nozzles were set up with uh, windshield wiper motors. So they would rotate back and forth 45 degrees and in order to get the desired output, we for our one inch of rainfall in 20 minutes, we used an 806 nozzle at 30 psi to get a half inch of rainfall. We used a nozzle that was half the size um, with the same pressure, so our droplet size would would be the same. So let's go on to the next one. So this here shows you the um, the amount of atrazine that we recovered on the cereal rye plants. So um, as you might expect, um, the, uh, um, it, it was a little bit easier to, uh, to wash the, uh, the herbicide residue off of the standing um, rye plants than it was at the roll plants. You can see here we have at, at the half inch and one inch of rainfall treatments, we have more um, on the, um, um, on the uh, rolled cereal rye than we have on the standing cereal rye. And that just makes sense once you roll that cereal ride down onto the ground. It's essentially like a like a blanket covering the ground. Let's go on to the next slide. 
And that kind of shows you the amount that you're able to wash off of there. And again, for some reason, that number didn't come through when I emailed this pres <laughs> presentation over. But essentially, you're able to reduce it um, by a pretty significant amount with just an inch of rainfall. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, here's the atrazine concentration in the soil. And so what this shows you, um, the, uh, the one on the, on the far uh, right-hand side is the, the concentration that's uh, in, in the soil. And as you can see here, you know, the amount in the soil was fairly constant. Um, in our time zero sampling, I think that was kind of a function of, of the way we collected the samples, but uh, getting uh, um, the herbicide residue wash, getting the herbicides washed off of the, the, the cover crop residue um, wasn't too terribly problematic, but you can see within it, with an inch of rainfall there that the rolled cereal rye tended to retain more of the residue than the standing cereal rye did. So again, just putting that blanket out there on the ground does create a little bit more difficulty in getting the herbicide residue washed onto the soil. So let's go on to the next slide. And essentially, what, one way to look at that is, is it could be a detriment to have it hung up on the residue. Um, but another way to look at it, too, is that you could be looking at that rolled cereal rye as maybe a, a, a slow release type of a mechanism. And it could be, you know, it, it could keep the herbicide from being degraded by microbes um, as long as you get the precipitation events to continue to wash it off onto the soil as well. So that's something we need to investigate a little bit further um, moving forward, just in terms of, you know, how persistent these uh, herbicide residues on, they are on the cereal rye residue versus um, in the soil. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so again, um, I think if we summarize this, we can say the roller crimp cereal rye is acting as a slow release mechanism. I think that's an area that, that you know, we could certainly investigate a little bit further. In terms of the practical implications, from a positive standpoint, the roller crimping does protect your soil from erosion. Um, it can reduce herbicide leaching, uh, but it does intercept more residue and it's a little bit more difficult to wash it off of the residue. So that could be problematic from the standpoint of not having a high enough concentration in the soil for weed control or if you have a situation where there might be a crop injury concern with a herbicide such as Valor or Authority or one of those, um, if, you have, if you get a rainfall event when that soybean is emerging up through that residue, it could create a situation where you have a little bit more crop response or crop injury from, from that type of interaction. So again, that's, that's an area that does require a little bit more study. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, so I think that to summarize here, um, the good news is, is that, you know, we evaluated a couple different active ingredients. We certainly didn't ev evaluate all of them. This uh, research tends to be labor intensive and it takes a lot of time and money. We really didn't see a lot of negative interactions. You know, there's a little bit of, of concern with these rolled um, cereal rye crops and, and getting the herbicides washed off of that but most of the interactions are, are neutral to positive. And so um, I think that's, you know, that's, that's good news. Uh, to answer the question about cover crops replacing herbicides, because I get that question a lot, I'd say for mare's tail and annual grass, you know, the answer's a, a, a yes maybe, but I think for every other problematic weed, I think we need to be use, utilizing cover crops as a supplement to herbicides rather than thinking about replacing them. So again, I do think there's some potential there with mare's tail and annual grasses, but not with any of the other um, weeds that, that we evaluated. And again, I, I would point out, we looked at a handful of active ingredients. Um, there's more of them out there. There's more premixes out there. And, and certainly there's, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. All right, let's go on to the next slide. And just uh, my final slide here, here's, here's a plug for some fact sheets that we put together um, that discuss cover crops and, and weed management. And this is some work that um, I've been involved with now for over a decade. Um, the, the, the United Soybean Board is a very important sponsor of a lot of our research and extension activities. And this, this is a series of guide sheets that we put together about a year or so ago that, 
that address a number of different topics related to cover crops and weed control. Uh, next slide. So that's kind of the end of my um, presentation. And I think at this point, I'm supposed to hand this off back to you guys. Yep, yep, I'll take this, this slide, next couple slides. Yeah, so if you're watching today um, to get your CCA CEU credit, please email um, Elena W at iastate.edu uh, by five o'clock today. That's A-L-E-N-A-W at iastate.edu. Um, please include your name the name you entered to watch the Zoom, and then your CCA number. Um, next slide there, yeah. Um, so if you haven't already this year, please go ahead and take our voluntary demographic survey. Um, we only need one response for the year, so if you've already done it, there's no need to do it again. Um, and then next slide there. Um, so yes, next week we will be um, hearing from Eric Henning. Um, he's going to be comparing infiltration between prairie strips and row crop fields across Iowa. So um, feel free to keep adding questions, um, but we can go ahead and start uh, reading some of these off. So the first question we have here is um, for the water hemp biomass uh, graph. When was the residual applied in the two weeks after planting treatment? Uh, was that a burn down or? Nope. Yeah, that, that would have been applied. So that was applied before the, um, that would have been apply, applied at planting. We did not apply that two weeks after planting. So we did, we, we terminated the cover crop with uh, glyphosate, glyphosate 2,4-D at two weeks after planting, but the residual was put on at planting because the residual that we used down there cannot be used on emerged soybeans. All right. Um, so another question we have here, um, did you look at all? Did you at all look at the relationship between um, different cover crop treatments and herbicide runoff? So, um, to, all right. So we, we did not measure runoff from the plots. We measured the herbicide concentrations on the cereal rye residue and in the soil. Yeah. Um, another question we got is. If the residual is getting caught in the cereal rye biomass, why not apply it when the cover crop is smaller uh, to still get the residual product to the soil? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's really, you know, kind of the basis of what we're trying to tease out with this type of research. So again, I think you'll get every weed scientist to agree that in, you know, um, allelopathy is not reliable for weed control, but biomass is. And we always see um, with more biomass, we get better weed control out of the cover crop. So to get back to the, to the question, um, there's, there's no question whatsoever, you, you'll get more herbicide deposited to the soil if you spray when the cover crop is small, but then the benefit or, or the the uh, contribution of the cover crop to weed control is less. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find that sweet spot. How I, I want as much biomass as possible, but I still want my residual herbicide to work. And so that's why we've got all these different trials with different termination timings is to try to tease out the answer to that. Yeah, another question we got was um, for atrazine concentration in soil, wouldn't it be better to analyze 10 different soil samples at grid sampling rather than to composite 10 soil samples in one? Uh, this can minimize the analysis error and report the deviation of measurements. Yeah, so I, I've been doing environmental fate work since the 1990s, and there's always questions about how you, whether you analyze your samples separately or whether you pool them within a plot. So, um, Basically what I showed you there, those samples are analyzed. Um, let's see, we, we, there's four reps in that experiment. And at the time zero, we are analyzing them separately. When we get out past time zero, then we're doing more of a composite analysis. Great. Um, so if anybody else has any more questions and go ahead and wait a few minutes and add those to the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for giving us this presentation. It's very interesting. Um, but yeah.
please tune in next week if there's no more questions to our webinar next week at noon, next Wednesday. So thank you all, all right. for attending. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you for having me.